The following program, General Grant Looks at the American Civil War, is a presentation of the Civil War Broadcasting Network. It is one of that series of programs wherein General Grant lifts up a person, place, or event in the war for review and reflection. It is available on the free YouTube channel, Dr. E.C. Fields, on Facebook under Kurt Fields as generally this is as Grant, and other social media. Permission to copy and distribute is granted and indeed encouraged. Remember, you are the future of our past. And now, General Grant looks at the American Civil War, from Vicksburg to Chattanooga. I'm General Ulysses S. Grant, and you find me in the field and operations near Chattanooga. The odyssey of my being here in Chattanooga is uh, one, I think, of some note that I should like to share with you and reflect. But let's go back to the fall of Vicksburg on the 4th of July of 63. There are three armies, major armies in the field. Lee is south of the Rapidan. Bragg is in Middle Tennessee, not far from Nashville. And Joe Johnston is still in Mississippi between myself and Vicksburg and Jackson, Mississippi. I sent Sherman to Jackson to uh, deal with Johnston. Johnston fell back into Jackson, Mississippi, and uh, Sherman put him under something of siege conditions. And on the night of July 16th, Johnston slipped away overnight with a, an evacuation no less astonishing than that of Beauregard a year ago, getting out of Corinth and escaping Halleck. Uh, and he took all of his artillery and heavy wagons with him. It was a good move on Johnston's part, <clears throat> but he evacuated Mississippi. I wanted to move on Mobile, Alabama. It's the only deep water port left to the Confederates in the Gulf of Mexico and east of the Mississippi River. But, and in fact, I sent two telegrams to General Halleck, late July, I think August 1st as well, and asked him to uh, give me permission to move on Mobile because the Confederates could not get enough men between us and them to save Mobile. I had uh, upwards of 100,000 men at that time immediately after the fall of Vicksburg, but that was not to happen. Uh, instead, I had to send uh, troops back north uh, to the Army of the Potomac. I, had, I sent 5,000, I believe it was, with Ord to Banks in New Orleans to go against the uh, Louisiana, Texas area because of Maximilian's threat there troops here, troops there, and <clears throat> just like what happened after uh, Corinth, a mighty army was parsed out, and I began actually to fear about whether or not I could defend myself. Now, I wanted to go against Mobile, but President Lincoln, well, Halleck told me in, in expressing uh, the wishes of the President and the Secretary of War Stanton, uh, that we needed to have those troops in uh, Louisiana and Texas. But the president got wind of this, and on August the 9th, he sent me a telegram that uh, was enlightening to me. I see by a dispatch of yours that you incline quite, uh, quite strongly toward an expedition against Mobile. That would appear tempting to me also were it not that, in view of recent events in Mexico, I am greatly impressed with the importance of establishing national authority in western Texas as soon as possible. Now, I valued that. I did not view it as a, a knuckle wrapping, but I, I valued the president taking time to send me a telegram to assuage my concerns and tell me why I was being denied going to Mobile. 
Now, what had happened there was Benito Juarez has been established, had been established as the uh, ruler of Mexico and promptly declared a two-year moratorium on paying their debts. France, Britain, and Spain all came together and actually sent troops there, vessels there, and uh, they got their money. Mexico paid them their money, but France stayed in the area. Now, Napoleon III wants to establish world presence of France again, and he feels that going through Mexico is the way to do it. He also is loudly sympathetic to the Confederacy and, in fact, is trying to convince other leaders in Europe to come in the war on the side of the Confederacy. He sent 35,000 troops to Mexico. They marched, uh, just like Scott did, from the coast to Mexico City, took Mexico City and uh, took over control of Mexico and put Maximilian as a puppet emperor in control of Mexico. So the president feels he can't send uh, troops to Mobile. He needs to establish that national authority, as he said to me in this telegram, in West Texas as soon as possible. So I had uh, not only the gratitude that the commander-in-chief himself would speak to me about this, send me a telegram, but to explain to me in some limited manner what he was wanting to do and why he was denying me. So following those weeks in July uh, and August, I'm sending troops hither and yon. There's not a, a rebel threat within 100 miles of Vicksburg. Uh, and I'm chaffing at the bit. There's idleness. I don't like garrison duty. I've got a war to win, and I want to be about it. I did ask uh, General Halleck permission to go to New Orleans and to confer personally with General Banks, and uh, he granted that permission. So on September 2nd, I arrived in New Orleans, and there was a great levy held at the St. Charles, or at the residence of General Banks, and uh, uh, much celebrating. On September 3rd, General Banks and I had two carriages and he showed me around New Orleans and toured. And I was anxious to see New Orleans because it was there back in 46 that I had made my jumping off point to go into the war. And it was actually for me, it was a most significant place because it's where I ceased really being a boy and uh, with a brevet second lieutenant ranking out of the academy and went into war. So New Orleans holds a special place for me and I was anxious to see it again. On the 4th of September, uh, General Banks wanted me to review uh, his troops uh, in Carrollton, Louisiana, some four miles away from New Orleans and there was much to do about that. Now, Banks had gotten me a large black horse, largely untamed, that nobody else had been able to ride. And uh, uh, I'd, I'd, people hint that it was intentional. I, I dismiss that. I don't know whether it was or not. But the horse was hard to control, and, but I like powerful, hard to control horses. We reviewed the troops, and on the way back into New Orleans, a train came around the curve and paralleled the road that we were on, and uh, he recognized me, I believe, and laid down on his whistle. The, ho the horse bucked because the road was badly rutted, and he bolted, reared back, as I understand, and fell on me. Now, apparently nobody knows what happened because one story is that the horse bolted, reared, and uh, fell, and another horseman behind me, we were at, at the, the, the rapid trot, another officer ran over myself and the horse, injuring them. 
another story is that our carriage careened and hit me and a carriage ran over me. So nobody really understands or describes to me accurately what happened. I do know that I was not thrown from the horse. The horse fell over on me, was knocked senseless. I was unconscious. And one officer that was there, I think a Lieutenant Parker, described me as we thought he was dead. Of course, surgeons and the crowd rushed to me. They found no broken bones. They thought they crushed my thigh, extricated me from under the horse, got the horse up. And uh, some two or three days later, in the St. Charles Hotel, I regained consciousness. And my left leg from my knee to my thigh was swollen almost to the point of bursting the skin all up under my left side and ribs. I probably had some broken ribs up under my armpit was extremely sore and swollen. I was so beaten up, I could not turn myself over in the bed. And I stayed in bed there for uh, a week or so. And finally, I believe it was September 13, 14, I had to get back to Vicksburg. <clears throat> so I had a steamer come to the wharf closest to where I was. They put me in a litter and carried me to the steamboat and took me back to Vicksburg. And I got there, I believe, on September the 16th or thereabouts. I... Uh, telegraphed General Halleck and told him I'm still in bed, but uh, I can't get up. I hope to resume duties, uh, full duties soon. I was on a crutch and, and hobbling. But while I was in New Orleans, it was something of a relaxation. I read Feniziana, which was written by George Derby, a collection of short stories, much in the, the line of uh, a humorist. And we had gone to the academy together, Feniziana, and uh, I was uh, laughing out loud at it, and discussing the book with my friends who came to visit me. But I was able to make some good use of my downtime. Now, Julia, when I, when I got back to Vicksburg, I went to the Lum house, 26-room mansion, Mr. Lum and his family. And uh, Julia and our youngest son, Jesse, who is five years old, going on six, came down and joined me. And I was overjoyed. I always, always loved to have Julia with me, and particularly one, at least one of my children. Julia had put the other three in school in St. Louis and came down to be with me. So I re was recuperating there and getting getting some work done and, and marking time, I thought. But something was afoot because uh, mid-September, I began getting orders, send men to uh, Rosecrans in Chattanooga. And I sent uh, Sherman in a division, then I sent a more uh, critical telegram came in, I'd send a division with McPherson across the river to Trans-Mississippi. I called him back. Sherman is en route to uh, Chattanooga on the Memphis and Charleston and having to rebuild it as he goes. In fact, was caught in quite a pitched battle in Collierville, Tennessee, and was nearly captured. They caught his horse, Dolly. Hand-to-hand uh, -hand combat on the trains. They steamed right into a fight in Collierville where... Uh, uh, Chalmers, General Chalmers under Forest Command, was trying to retake Collierville, and the fort that was there, and the control from Memphis and Charleston coming out of Memphis, some 20 miles west of Collierville. Sherman narrowly escaped capture. Uh, but we were sending troops, and we found out later that on the 19th and 20th that Bragg had hit Rosecrans and uh, uh, soundly defeated him. And that bears a little reflection as well. Uh, the last couple of days of December, first day of January, uh, the Battle of Stones River was fought there near Murfreesboro, Tennessee. And it was one of the more savage battles fought so far. 
In fact, Rosecrans and Bragg both lost about a third of their armies in that fight. And Bragg fell back a little southeast of Nashville, and Rosecrans is in Murfreesboro and into Nashville, some few miles away. It, but the, the Mur Murfreesboro was critical, but Rosecrans wouldn't move. Halleck, I, I kept wanting Rosecrans to move on Bragg in Middle Tennessee because I thought, well, we can decimate Bragg while he is there, or if I can move on Mobile, Bragg will have to either send troops to Mobile and Rosecrans can more easily defeat him in detail, or Bragg won't send troops and I can go to Mobile and wreak havoc there with Confederate supplies because both Bragg and Lee are getting supplies from that port in Mobile, Alabama, deep water port in the Gulf of Mexico. But that was not to be. Halleck tells me he can't get uh, Rosecrans to move. Rosecrans is saying, I need more men, I need more wagons, I need more horses and mules, I need more of this, I need more of that. And finally, Halleck sent him an order, move without delay. This is a few days into September and uh, Rosecrans begins moving against Bragg. Bragg fell down to the southeast into Chattanooga and then south of Chattanooga into the Georgia mountains there around Chickamauga Creek. Now Rosecrans is pushing in and feeling pretty good because he's, he feels that he's got Bragg on the run. But Bragg is not really on the run. He has gotten Longstreet and a couple of divisions from Lee in Virginia. Bragg is reforming his army south of that Chickamauga Creek and has 65,000 battle-hardened veterans who are seething to get at Rosecrans and the Army of the Cumberland. And on September the 18th into the 19th, they hit him. So the next two days or so, one of the most savage fights in the Western theater occurs. And both armies, again, lose substantial numbers. I think 38,000 were killed and wounded, total casualties for the two armies after more than two days of fighting. Now, Rosecrans, I don't know. I was not there. But it appears that Rosecrans panicked and the word fled is used to get back into Chattanooga some 11 miles northwest of the Chickamauga Creek. George Thomas, old slow trot, nicknamed from the academy where he wanted to preserve the horses because they were all nags that we had to train on, ordered at the trot slow. So that became the nickname. A better one perhaps would be Pap because his troops loved him. Thomas is a professional. He's a good man and he worked hard to husband his troops and not subject them to peril unnecessarily. Well, his men were armed with repeaters and they were there in at the, the knoll blocking uh, Rosecrans retreat and firing and resisting and gave Rosecrans escape into Chattanooga. And Thomas justifiably and well-deservedly got the nickname The Rock of Chickamauga because he did not give. When it was safe and appropriate, he withdrew into Chattanooga. So now Bragg has got troops on Chattanooga uh, Lookout Mountain to the west of Chattanooga, Missionary Ridge to the east of Chattanooga, and the Tennessee River and Creek in the valley, he's got a line stretching of troops between uh, Lookout and Raccoon Mountain. So the only way to get troops or uh, uh, food into Chattanooga is out of Bridgeport, Alabama. The rebels have burned the bridge across the Tennessee River, and you got to get the goods to uh, Stevens, Alabama, and then into Bridgeport across the Tennessee River. 
and a wagon trail up Walden's Ridge, which is 60 miles, 60 to 75 miles, depending upon whom you ask, across a ridge that is some of the roughest terrain in the region. And that's the only way that he can get in food. So his troops are bottled up. Uh, Bragg, in fact, felt like that. Bragg did not bother to attack. He felt like they were already his prisoners of war. He just didn't have to feed them. So they're in desperate straits. On October the 10th, or, and, and by the time the troops requested are en route to assist Rosecrans, the battle's already been fought. It's too late. So the Army of the Cumberland is in a jug court by Bragg on Missionary Ridge, Lookout, and Raccoon Mountain, and looking down on Rosecrans, and his men are beginning to starve. And they don't have clothing appropriate for the approaching winter, and they don't have anything to eat. On October the 10th, I got a telegram in Vicksburg from General, oh, and I also should like to tell you that on July 7th, after the fall of Vicksburg, I was promoted to Major General Regular Army. So I'm very pleased with that. I did not seek it, but it came to me. So now I'm a Major General Regular Army. But the telegram I got on the 10th, it was written on the 3rd, and it was the 10th before I got it. Now, I need to also tell you at this juncture that after that occurred, I sent an aide to Cairo, Illinois, to personally see that or bring messages to me in Vicksburg because giving messages to troops to bring south, they were in no hurry. They, the war gave them no sense of urgency, so two or three or four days didn't matter. Well, in matters like this, it mattered a great deal. And uh, I got the telegram sent the 3rd on the 10th. Report to Cairo, Illinois for further instructions. You are to meet a representative of the War Department. Bring your staff with you ready for immediate field operations. Now, that's all it said. Of course, I'm a <laughs> Pardon me. I'm a major general. I'm in command of an army in Vicksburg. I have some stature, some status. And all I am told by my general in chief is report you are to meet a representative of the War Department. This chagrined me a bit, but I replied I will leave immediately and Julia and Jesse and myself steamed north. I got to Columbus and uh, telegraphed that I'm at Columbus about to go to Cairo, uh, about to go across the river. And uh, I sent quickly a reply, go to, from Cairo, proceed to the Galt House in Louisville, Kentucky, where you will meet a representative of the War Department. Now, I, Julia and Jesse and I get, get on the train there at Cairo, and we spend the day going to <clears throat> Indianapolis. In Indianapolis, as we are about to leave to go to Louisville, a messenger comes running into the train, stops the train, and says, the Secretary of War, Stanton, is joining you on the train. He had taken a special train from Washington City and with some aides, uh, um, Governor Bro of Ohio, uh, whom I had never met, but he and my father had been, uh, were good friends. So the governor of Ohio was with Secretary Stanton and uh, he came, it was raining, and he's got asthma and he wasn't feeling well, he'd caught a cold. When he came into my car, he immediately dashed over to Dr. Edward Coteau, E.B. Coteau, my surgeon, my personal physician, 
and who has a beard as do I and I was leaning on some furniture across the car and Stanton we'd never met he rushes to Dr. Coteau grabs his hand pumping his hand with both hands and saying General Grant I know you from the pictures yes sir I know you anywhere and very enthusiastic he talks very quickly uh, in a manner that's almost frantic like this and uh, when Dr. Coteau could get a word in he said I'm not Grant he's Grant and Secretary Stanton looked crestfallen, turned to me, I smiled and nodded and extended my hand. And he immediately says, General Grant, I'd know you anywhere, and repeated what he just said. But he did seem nonplussed that he had gone to Dr. Coteau instead of me saying, I would know you anywhere. And uh, he was in less than a good mood for the rest of the night when we rode on through the night talking and apprising me of the situation. Uh, he, as we were about to get off the train in Louisville, he gave me two envelopes, referred both of them to me, and said, here are your orders. You may choose as you will. And in those orders, in those orders, the first, the first paragraph of both was identical, and it reads, well, and it reads this way: by direction of the President of the United States, the departments of the Ohio, the Cumberland, and the Tennessee will constitute the military division of the Mississippi. Major General U.S. Grant, United States Army, is placed in command of the Military District of the Mississippi with his headquarters in the field, A. Lincoln. So now, well, and the second paragraph of one left General Rosecrans in command of the Army of the Cumberland. The second paragraph in the other replaced General Rosecrans with General George Thomas. I took the latter and handed back to the Secretary of War the orders that left Rosecrans in command. And we proceeded to the golf house. And this is on the 18th uh, into, or the 19th by now, and we talked all day, talked all day. The, the secretary is an intense man, very knowledgeable, and wanted to bring me to full awareness of everything going on in the Eastern Theater and the Western Theater. And by the end of the day, I thought he, he must be talked out, and apparently he was, and Julia and I went to the theater. Uh, she has an aunt. Her mother's youngest sister uh, lives in Louisville with her husband and family. <clears throat> we went to the theater. While, and it rained, had rained all day and the day before, cold rain, and the secretary is coming down even more seriously with the cold. At about 11 o'clock, when we returned to the golf house, in that time period before, while we were at the theater, Charles A. Dana, who had been uh, essentially a spy for Stanton with Rosecrans for quite some time, had sent the secretary a telegram that said, you must send help quickly. Rosecrans is about to surrender or evacuate with, with leaving everything but the men. Now that would have been a blow not only to the morale, but taking an army out of the field had they surrendered, and either surrender or evacuation, those artillery pieces were irreplaceable. That would have been a devastating blow. 
Secretary Stanton is excitable and was even more so. He had stopped everybody apparently in that hotel and in Byron's asking them where I was and would they please tell me to get to him as quickly as possible. So between the carriage and the hotel and in the hotel, everyone had taken it upon themselves to be the personal emissary of the secretary. I went to the secretary's room, it's getting close to midnight by now, and he was rapidly pacing the floor in his nightshirt and socks. And talking to himself and telling me when I got there what Dana had told him. I sat down immediately and wrote a telegram to General Rosecrans telling him he had been relieved of command. Another telegram to General Thomas saying that he was in command and that uh, I was ordering many shipments of fruit and vegetables and foodstuffs to be sent to Chattanooga via the wagon road up Walgreens Ridge uh, that would start simultaneously with me because I was going to leave on the morning of the 20th, the next morning. <clears throat> and I wanted to get that food going because I knew they were in straits, desperate straits. And it came, a telegram came back very shortly that, uh, and I had told George Thomas to hold it at all hazards. And in just a very short time, I received a response from George, and he said, we will hold it until we starve, and he gave me the listing of his rations. And essentially, it boiled down to, he had five days, and the men were already on half rations, had been on half rations of hard bread, hardtack. He had five days of food left for that army with another two days on some, on a wagon train, I believe some 300 wagons en route to Chattanooga, but they wouldn't be there for at least two days. So he had a maximum of seven uh, days of rations and all, they were already on half rations. About 10,000 horses and mules had already starved to death. There was no forage for any of the animals in Chattanooga or even close to it. There was no wood. Every piece of wood, building had been torn down, fences burned, even stumps chopped up and burned. The only way they could get any wood was to go up river a bit and cross over in small parties, chop wood down, lash them together and raft them down to Chattanooga, push them over with poles and paddles to the west side of the river or the east side of the river, rather. And, and each man or, or unit would get a, a, a tree, a log, and carry it back to their campsite. Now, that's how low they were. 10,000 animals had starved to death. The, the entire city was rankings of stench of dead animals. And uh, there was not enough horses or mules able to pull a single artillery piece. There was not enough ammunition in the city of Chattanooga to have lasted more than an hour in a fight, artillery or small arms. They were in the most desperate of straits. And George Thomas tersely told me when he replied, we will hold it until we starve. And it wasn't until I got there that I saw that he wasn't being dramatic by any means. He was serious. They were about to starve to death in Chattanooga. Because this is the going into the third week of October. They've been there since about September 20th, 21st. So they've, they've got a month that they've gotten no food or very little food in. I began the trip to Chattanooga the morning of the 20th, more rain, and traveled until that evening. And I was met in Nashville, Tennessee, by military governor Andrew Johnson. I had never met uh, Governor Johnson. He'd been the senator from Tennessee. In fact, he was the only senator 
from a seceding state that had stayed in the Senate. President Lincoln, even though he was a Democrat and a state's rights advocate, named him military governor of Tennessee because he was loyal, and with that came the rank of Brigadier General. But Johnson, who was a self-made man, met me, took me to the St. Cloud Hotel, and asked me to speak, I declined, uh, and whereupon he took it upon himself to speak. Now, I didn't know what was going to happen there, but I quickly realized that the welcoming speech that military governor, general, Senator Johnson was giving was not his maiden effort. Uh, was not his maiden effort by any means. And I was really terrified that he was going to want me to say something, but mercifully enough, he did not. And mercifully enough, after his rather lengthy welcoming speech to me, the people who had gathered there had had enough too. And at the first opportunity, they swarmed over the two of us, wanting to shake my hand and pat me on the back. And I'm not I'm not fond of those kinds of situations, particularly when there's so much handshaking. But in this situation, I was pleased to shake hands and not hear any more speech. The next morning on the 21st, I again entrained and we got to Stevenson, Alabama and stopped to go to get ready to go to Bridgeport, Alabama, the jumping off place to get into Chattanooga. Now, when I was in Stevenson, there at the train station was General O. O. Howard. And uh, he is known as the Christian General. He's a Medal of Honor winner. He lost his arm at uh, Fair Oaks back in 62 in the Peninsula Campaign. Very, very nice gentleman. And he happened to be in the train station when I got there. And we came and visited, or he came and visited, and we had a very genial talk. Now, I understand that he later said that uh, he, we had never met, that he was uh, astonished when he met me that I was as small as I was. He said, he's hardly bigger than McClellan. I am a couple of inches taller than McClellan, uh, but not much. Uh, but he said I, he was expecting a bigger man, considering what I had done, that I was pale and uh, very soft-spoken. And as soon as he entered the car, he, I extended my hand and said, good to meet you, General. Let's sit down and talk, which I did. While he was there, uh, Rosecrans came in. Rosecrans was in route back north uh, for whatever awaited him. And he came and we talked for, at length. And uh, I, I was surprised. I asked him, he gave me a very detailed description of the situation. And I asked him, well, General, what would you do if you were staying? And he went into great detail and told me exactly what he would do and I was very surprised because it was exactly what I had planned to do. I only wondered, why didn't you do it while you were there? Lincoln had described him being in Chattanooga 